Okay, so we've looked at the solid phase in terms of the particle size classes that result from weathering of the parent material and how particle size class affects movement of water through the soil. Other aspects of the solid phase uh, include the organic matter in the soil, uh, which we'll abbreviate OM, um, such as humus, we already talked about humus in the earlier. Um, and so the more, the higher the humus content um, will, well basically humus content is sort of um, linearly or so in some way positively related to water holding capacity. So if we have more humus content then the water holding capacity uh, increases the, the amount of water that can be retained by soils. And that's because organic matter contains a lot of hydro um, philic surfaces, hydrophilic. So it acts like um, it's sort of analogous here to a sponge. So not only is it sort of soaking up or holding on to water more readily, it's also more porous, so it, it, it increases the um, aeration, it increases the aeration of soil. which is good for oxygen content. Uh, another part, aspect of the uh, solid phase would be the soil, I'm just going to fit here on the slide, the soil, or, soil organisms such as things like earthworms, um, bacteria, fungi, uh, nematodes, calembola, mites, um, the whole food web, there's a whole food web in soils, um, invertebrates, and all of these organisms tend to increase aeration in the soil, making more soil channels, uh, and also the porosity, they kind of go together. Um, so earthworms in fact are great for soils, they increase the organic mat uh, matter content as they turn over um, the organic material, and um, they channel, they create channels through the soil as they move through soils. All right, in this diagram here, we're going to see next <coughs> back to soil texture uh, with regard to those particle size classes. Um, <coughs> the combination of soil of those class size classes can create a soil texture that we can classify as either in high clay content. Um, so clay is um, shown on this axis way over here um, versus a silt content, which is that middle size class, versus the sand content. So soils that are rich in sand are over in this quad, this um, part of the triangle, rich in clay are up here, rich in silt are down here. Loam is considered to be the ideal soil. Equals loam, um, which is about 40 percent silt, 40 percent sand, and 20 percent clay. So this all has to add up to 100 percent basically for the soil texture. So we'll start with um, the silt axis here and we'll come down to about here and you can see 40 percent um, is the line that's going to cross over into this region. So that's the 40% of silt. Then that's going to meet up here with the 40% of sand there, and then what's left is the 20% from clay. So loam is considered to be that ideal soil. It's ideal because um, there's a good amount of water holding capacity from the clay, but also a good amount of uh, aeration and porosity from the sand and the silt combined. All right. So that takes care of our solid phase of soil that we spent a little bit of time here talking about. Um, I think we have a, there we go. We also have just a couple of other notes here. Um, the the liquid phase of soil 
is basically the soil solution. That's what we, we call it, the soil solution, which is um, water as a solvent plus dissolved solutes, things like um, ions, organic acids, like tannic acids, for example. Uh, carbonic acid would be an inorganic acid, carbonic acid, carbonic acid. Um, and also polysaccharides released from roots to attract bacteria and fungi. So all of these can be part of the liquid phase. And then we've got our gas phase here. We'll be spending most of the time looking at how the liquid phase and the solid phase interact. Um, the gas phase is basically where the, the atmosphere in the soil is always in equilibrium with the, um, air, with the atmosphere. So the, the gas phase of soil is in equilibrium with, with the atmosphere, which means that there's a certain component of the soil uh, gas phase that is um, oxygen and a certain component that is uh, nitrogen gas and a certain component that's carb uh, carbon dioxide and so forth. All right. Now in the next figure here, we're going to kind of add some notes before we get here, which talks about um, basically how we, we use some terminology to describe water content in soils. All right, so that's kind of what we're concentrating on here. I'm going to go back up to this size. So if we were to sort of pose this as a question um, to sort of focus on, to kind of give some relevance to the material here, how does soil texture, which remember is the proportion, there's an abbreviation there, of sand to silt to clay. How does soil texture affect water availability? And in this case, we're referring to water that's available to plants. Um, and that doesn't always mean more is better. Um, so let's talk about how to, some of the, what terms we're using here to describe water content in soils that's related to um, whether water is available or not to plants. So here we are in a situation where we're after a fresh rain. Uh, water basically is going to percolate through the soil um, and fills or filling all pores, all the sort, the large pores and the capillary pores. And we refer to um, that type of soil, the water content in that soil, as saturated. This is a saturated soil. Okay, so saturated soils. Um, this water that's uh, percolating through displaces all the air in in the in the different sizes of pores. All right, then when gravity drains uh, water from the large pores. which is called percolation, then that water is referred to as gravitational water. It's not a term that describes soils, it's a term that describes water. The water that percolates through the soils, leave, soils leaving the large pores um, empty. And gravitational water uh, is basically similar to, analogous to, water in a beaker. 
All right. So there's not much limiting its flow other than the direction of, of you know, the gravity, the force of gravity. So this has gravitational water has a water potential. We're going to use water potentials in soils now. Um, that's equal to a range here of negative 0.03 megapascals um, to 0 megapascals. So we've got that range there that we're working with. And then the soil that's remaining in the capillary, the soil water um, that's remaining in the capillary pores remaining in capillary pores uh, is is where when soil only has water left in its capillary pores then we say the soil this is a soil water content term the soil is at field capacity Okay, so it's no longer saturated soil, it's now soil at field capacity. And soil at field capacity has um, basically the maximum amount of water that is available for plant uptake. Again, that's water in capillary pores only. All right, that maximum amount of water available for plant uptake in soils at field capacity is equal, this is a water con uh, term here, is equal to um, the water holding capacity, which we already defined water holding capacity. It's the maximum amount of water content in soils um, that can be retained. All right, water holding capacity. And remember we abbreviated that like this. Now in terms of a water potential, we're looking at field capacity soils being at a water potential that's equal to zero, oh, negative, negative 0 0.03 megapascals, that upper end of the range there, or just beyond that range for gravitational water. So the, fields, the, the field capacity soil is at um, water potential of negative 0 0.03 megapascals. Now we're going to continue down to the figure now and see how this all looks um, diagrammatically. So you can see the, the with the same volume of coarse sand as we have silty clay loam, uh, there's in, in soil that's mostly sand has um, a large amount of larger amount of gravitational water than in silty clay loam. This is where the um, this is where the, the soil would be saturated here. Saturated. Okay, and as we move down in the figure, we see less and less water. So it, once the gravitational water is actually removed, um, then we're down to the water holding capacity, which is here at field capacity. Soils. All right, so there's more gravitational water in sand soil compared to silt and clay, but then we see the available water that's be below field capacity or below water holding capacity comes down to a certain level here until we reach uh, this section here that's called unavailable water. And unavailable water is the, all the water that's uh, left when the water in capillary pores, most of it is actually when most of it has uh, either evaporated or moved out of the area and then there's this thin film of uh, water that's bound to soil particles called uh, which is where soils are left at their permanent wilting point uh, and we'll spell that out here in just a minute then, then the rest as we said right down here is all bound water which is tightly adhering to the surfaces of soils and is therefore unavailable water to plant. In the next diagram we'll be able to see how the soil actually looks down here with uh, different sizes of soil pores and water content.